Eagles Entertainment. Welcome, Eagles, everywhere to the Eagles Insider Podcast, presented by Lincoln Financial Group. I'm Eagles Insider Dave Spadaro at the Novacare Complex, getting ready for training camp, which is, drum roll, please, less than a month away. So um, we're excited, and we're also looking ahead to 2021. We're going to look back at 2020. We've got a very special guest for this Eagles Insider Podcast. Please welcome once again our Vice President of Football Operations and Compliance, the great John Ferrari. Hi, John. Dave, how are you doing this morning? John, I'm doing just great. Hey, John, uh, for those who don't know, because you've, you've been on the podcast, you are, I think, a star for me. For me, for, for those who know you, um, I look forward. For I look forward to our. I look forward to our annual rules talks. Um, I, I love it. Year. I, I love me too. So, um, okay, be, before we proceed, for those who don't understand, what is a vice president of football operations and compliance? Uh, okay, well, I make sure that, uh, you know, under Howie's direction and Howie's leadership uh, and also Coach Sirianni's leadership, that all the football ops departments have what they need, that they're working in conjunction with each other, that everybody is working in the same direction. Everybody has their resources. Of, everybody understands the resources available to them. And, uh, and then in terms of the compliance aspect, um, anything that has to do with the league rules, any league manual, so the game operations manual, the CBA, um, you know, working with the football administration department, uh, making sure that we are abiding by every league rule and we are never going to get into uh, have any issues with the league because we're doing everything in a compliant way. Involved job, John? Uh, would you say it's a, a an all-consuming job? I would say that. I would say that's fair to say. Uh, it's a great situation for me because – you get to interact with everyone in the organization. Um, you know, get to interact with the PR department, obviously with the players, with the coaches, with the uh, the football ops staff, with the personnel staff, and Howie, with uh, with with the ownership group. Um, get to touch all aspects of the organization. So I'm very very lucky in that respect. And John, never in the history of the world has that coordination um, really been more important than it was in 2020. Look. The world went through just horrible times, pandemic, COVID-19. And from an NFL standpoint, very difficult to navigate all the different channels to make sure that a season was had. And I wonder if you could just, before we go into 2021, look back at 2020 and kind of put it into perspective. I know on the football field, nobody was happy with 4-11-1. and But from an operations standpoint, from a compliance standpoint, how did it go from you as you, as you take a look back? Well... You know, it was challenging, David, because in this league, we are, we plan. We are all planners. We want to plan. We want to plan. You know, the day is well planned out to the, to the minute. And then, you know, every week is planned out. Every six months is planned out. We are planners. And one of the things that last year uh, didn't allow us to do was plan and do long-term planning. So, for example, you know, we're waiting on the league. We're waiting on the NFLPA to give us uh, protocols so we can have a training camp calendar. And that didn't come until after the 4th of July. That's months after we would normally have that. So there's so, when you have, when you, when you have a pandemic and people concerned just about themselves and their families, and then you add the uncertainty of, are we going to have a season and what's that schedule going to look like? And how are we going to be, you know, what's it going to, uh, how's it going to come together? Um, you know, that just adds another layer of uncertainty on top of that. And it definitely, it's frustrating and it takes its toll. That being said, from a from a COVID standpoint, I thought we were excellent last year. Um, you know, Don and Howie and Coach Peterson's leadership in terms of the COVID protocols uh, was really outstanding. Set a tone for the organization, for the players, that I thought was really second to none. Um, guys wore their masks. We revamped the entire NOACARE complex to accommodate social distancing. Um, we were used every square inch of that building, uh, including – um, space that's not usually uh, set aside for the football team. So we really, we, we went that extra mile. And I think to your point, what you said earlier, that's what made 4 11, and one so much more disappointing than a normal season would be that there was so much extra work that went into um, making the building safe and making that, you know, we wanted that place to be the safest place for everyone to be. Uh, to spend their days. And the fact that, you know, the season went the way it was, was obviously 
uh, incredibly disappointing. But we move forward. And John, moving forward also with perhaps taking some of the ideas that you learned uh, that work, some of the some of the protocols in place. Like, are there things that were done in 2020, not just from an Eagle standpoint, but from a league standpoint, that maybe will be used in the future uh, to, to make this uh, a better game, a safer game um, uh, for everyone? I think there would, uh, absolutely is the short answer. Um, and I think that we, one of the things that I think we discovered uh, with our organization is really truly what an incredible group we have. You know, the way our facilities team rallied together and did, you know, with, you know, with fewer people available at their disposal, the fact that they did five times as much work, you know, says a lot about Jason Miller, Ryan, Ryan Hummel, Chris Bellis, and our facilities group. Our equipment staff with Greg Delamitros, how much they did without any help. See, normally we have, you know, we have interns, we have vendors, we have consultants, we have, re we couldn't have any of that last year because of the tier numbers. And we were limited in the number of people who could be in the building. So everybody had to do more and they had to do more with less. Normally when you have less, you do less, but that group really came together and did more last year. I think one of the things the league will take is some of the game day protocols, how we utilize the sidelines, how we utilize the locker room access. Um, I think some of those things were, are things that will carry forward. I also think how the coaches and players interacted with the media, <clears throat> not in a permanent way, but having the ability to communicate virtually. Um, I think that from the PR side, but then also meeting with the players and how we meet and having that virtual uh, being, being shown that you can be productive virtually, I think was a, um, a real hidden upside to a terrible situation last year. You know, that's interesting. Let me, let me offer my perspective. I mean, I, I agree with you, um, but I do think that, that fans missed out on some of the interpersonal workings with the media being so restricted. I, I don't know if you care about that or have an opinion on that, but I do think I'm, I'm glad that it sounds like we're going to be allowed back in the locker rooms this year. I think it adds an element to the coverage of a football team and what, what the fans can digest from Monday through Saturday leading into game day. I totally agree with that, Dave. I actually, and I want to clarify what I was saying. I think that being able to be productive virtually just adds another tool to the toolbox. So if there's some scenario where, you know, instead of having to have everyone come to NovaCare, we can put together a virtual press conference quickly, those types of things I mean. But yes, I absolutely agree that in the, in the, aggregate that we were we were lesser for the restricted media access last year no question yeah and i and i understood where you were coming from um but i just want to add my two cents because from our standpoint for sure, for I, sure. it just felt very distant um but that's just the way it had to be john how normal are we looking at for 2021 before we talk about the rule changes um just from a from a normal day-to-day -day operation standpoint as well as a game day standpoint yeah, it's exciting. It's exciting because what we're doing is taking, you know, some of those aspects of last year that were uh, that are going to carry over, and sometimes they get they're getting some in some ways they're getting scaled back a little bit. Um, you know, we, so we're going to have everyone in the building. Take, put the players aside for one second. Everyone in the building, our our coaches, our football ops staff, uh, media when they're in the building, everyone in the building is going to be vaccinated. So the building is going to be a fully vaccinated area, which, you know, we are very comfortable with in terms of its safety. You know, the players aren't required to be vaccinated. We will have, you know, hopefully have a lot of players be vaccinated and, but, and the, for the vaccinated players and the vaccinated staff, um, life will look a lot like 2019, um, you know, before this all started and, no masks, no social distancing, ability to eat in the cafeteria, little things like that that you kind of take for that we took for granted, I think, before this pandemic. Um, but there'll be there'll be a lot of normalcy um, for players who choose not to be vaccinated. It'll look a lot like last year with the distancing and the masks, the daily testing, et cetera. Um, so what we're trying to do is, you know, bring the facility and bring the physical plant back to a 2019 status while honoring what we need to do for those players who choose not to get the vaccine. Um, so that's a little bit of a balance, um, but we think we're in a really good place. And we think that um, hopefully training camp within the confines of these, of these um, 2021 protocols, 
um, is going to look a lot more like 2019 than 2020. So that's exciting. And what about from a fan standpoint, John? Uh, beginning with training camp, I mean, fans, do we know yet, permitted to attend practices at the NovaCare Complex? We will have our, well, we're, and I know this has been announced, we're excited that we'll have our two open practices on August 8th and August 22nd, um, obviously, which are huge events for for the team, but then also for our fans and, and those opportunities to engage. So that's really exciting. We'll be able to have our two open stadium practices, one, you know, in conjunction with, um, I think the both Eagles Autism Foundation benefits and one is uh, in the day after the Eagles Autism Challenge. It's a real Eagles Autism Foundation weekend, and that's really exciting. Um, that's going to be a great, a great weekend for the fans um, as we get really close to kickoff there at that point in August. Um, and we will, and then uh, the Novature Complex will have our, again, looking more like 2019, our normal, um, you know, our invited guests and our, our, our tent parties that we've been having. So it'll be similar to uh, 2020 with the understanding that there'll be less access to players. Um, we'll have to keep some physical distancing from players. Um, but so there'll be some restrictions, some COVID restrictions, but really in general, really, it'll be, um, it'll be a lot like 2019 and hopefully, you know, and this is the way it looks like society's trending and you go out there. So this is all, you know, this is all positive for all of us. It's so exciting. I, I, I'm, I just miss it so much. I can't wait for the players to get know, over there on July 27th. Uh, John, um, uh, game day travel, uh, final thing here. Like it, and I know that had to be a huge headache. I did not travel for the first time last year since, I hate to admit my age, but I first time I hadn't traveled. Who was the quarter? Who was the quarterback the last time? Okay, who was the quarterback the last time you didn't travel? Randall, Norm Ben Brockman, Norm Ben Brockman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, John. Uh, Jaws and Randall, um, <laughs> or maybe it was just Randall. By that time, it was just Randall. Um, so it, 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 all of that kind of goes back to normal too, John. As far as you know, your um, operations go, the, the travel looks a lot like 2019 and road games and fans from who are wearing midnight green and in the stands when we're on the road. Yeah. I mean, a lot, it goes back to, it goes largely back to normal. We, we will have some restrictions on the size of our travel party. It'll be a little bit more expanded than it was last year. Uh, again, everyone on that plane, other than those players who choose not to get vaccinated will be vaccinated uh, and will, so we'll, we'll, that'll be the travel party will come out of our tier one and tier two staff. So, um, but again, it, we, we will have a smaller travel party than we had in prior years, um, but more than 2020. And then how we interact around the hotel, again, will be um, similar to 2019, with the exception of those physical distancing and those elements that for to uh, be compliant for those unvaccinated players. Um, but yeah, it'll be it'll be a lot closer to normal than we had last year. We'll be able to, you know, last year you couldn't go for a walk. I mean, we could go for a walk, but you really couldn't go anywhere. So this year, just being able to um, have our normal team operation, I think will certainly be less of a distraction for the players and coaches and put us in a better position as we arrive at the stadium to play. And, and you know what's interesting, John? I Talking to players so much throughout last year and then throughout this offseason, how much they – and, and again, it goes back to what you said, taking for granted how much they missed having fans and the energy in the building and how much, you know, they've been playing their whole lives with, with people cheering them on. And maybe you take it for granted because it's always going to be there. And when it's not there, you look around and go, oh, my gosh, this is not nearly as much energy as, as, I, as I need, as I want. And so I think, I think players are really looking forward to having the stands filled again. When you when you work for the Philadelphia Eagles or you play for the Philadelphia Eagles, part of the um, the 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 best part of the job is playing for those fans and being involved in those fans and that energy of the stadium on game day. And you're absolutely right. When you score a touchdown and to cardboard cutouts, it ain't the same. So um, having having our fans back in the building will be. Uh, a tremendous boost for this team um, as we go into Coach Sirianni's first year. Um, I think, you know, there's a there's a shot of adrenaline from that coaching staff and then a shot of adrenaline from our fans. So I think that that's, uh, that's a really exciting piece of this uh, moving forward out of the pandemic or towards the end of the pandemic, I should say. Yeah, I found the crowd to be a little stiff last year. 
<laughs> but, um, um, that's a terrible thank joke, Dave. That's, that's thanks, 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 thank you. Uh, all right, let's get into some of the rules changes, John. Some of them are very obvious, not a whole lot to talk about, but um, let's begin with a, an obvious one. That's, that's, it's amazing that it took so long to be eliminated. No overtime in the preseason. Hallelujah. I mean, does anything else need to be said about that? I mean, that this was a that this is a, a long overdue change. So we get rid of so you don't have to as you're strategizing in the fourth quarter of a preseason game about how to avoid overtime. Now you don't have to worry about it. Now we can just play football. We can you know run that. You know if you have the, your backup players in there and you want to red, run your normal red zone offense and score a touchdown and we're going to kick the extra point. We want to give that kicker another uh, extra point rep. We don't have to go for two. It just um, it, uh, it's, uh, it gives those players, you know, we get a lot of reps in the preseason too. So uh, preseason and training camp. So, yep, no more overtime in the preseason. That's That was uh, a great change. John, uh, I, I have to include jersey numbers in here, jersey number changes. Uh, could you just kind of go through that? I think fans are probably pretty aware of it. We know that, for example, Jalen Hurts has changed his number to number one. Uh, Darius Slay is now number two. Um, how did this come about, and uh, what does it really mean? It was presented by the Chiefs, uh, and it, it, it changed the number system. You know, last year when we had – what this came out of was last year when we had uh, practice squad elevations. So we had an expanded number of practice squad players, and we had game day elevations of practice squad players. Well, all of a sudden, you know, we have numbers – you know, you had one through 99 and, you know, only certain positions could wear certain numbers. And when you get to that game day, you know, you get to this expanded practice squad. When you ha- when you look at retired numbers, numbers that are hanging in the rafters or numbers that we don't issue anymore, um, we get you get into a real number crunch. And I think what Kansas City was trying to do was address that and say, this doesn't really make any sense um, to be so restrictive on these numbers. So. You know, let's have some while while certain numbering is important, you know, being able to differentiate linemen from eligible receivers, that actually is important. Um, But beyond that, who cares if the quarterback and the receivers are wearing single digits? It doesn't really it doesn't really matter. Uh, So they uh, made that change and it passed pretty it passed pretty it wasn't unanimous, but it, it passed with a big margin. Uh, John, it's, it, tell me about the blocking. What is it? Blocking below the waist? No, no blindside blocking. What, explain what that what that rule changes. So it's a it is a change in legal low blocking. Okay, so in the NFL, different from college, there are there are there's always been restrictions on low blocking from behind. So you know, clipping that's low blocking from behind. A chop block is where. A player, a defensive player is engaged up high with an offensive player, and a second offensive player blocks him below the waist. He's not able to protect himself. A crackback block is when a flex player comes in and blocks low or high up in the head neck area on a player. So really what we've tried what they've tried to do in the past was players who are unable to protect themselves were protected from low blocks. But beyond that, low blocks, as long as you're blocking from the front, are legal in the NFL. Downfield low blocking in college is prohibited. Well, what we've done here is we've become more restrictive with our low blocks, um, as the league said, in an attempt to limit lower body injuries. So there's a – for the purposes of low blocking, before the snap, the officials are going to identify what they call a tight end box, two yards outside of a normal tackle position and five yards on either side of the line of scrimmage. They're going to draw an imaginary rectangle in their mind. That is in, within that box, low blocking from the front. Uh, that's that that was in, that was previously legal. Um, what we call cut blocking, you know, by an offensive lineman, that would remain legal inside that rectangle. Anywhere outside that rectangle, contact that's initiated below the waist will now be a foul for an illegal low block. With contact that was previously legal, that in 2020 was legal outside that box will now be illegal. Um, so there it's a, it's an initiative for player safety. Um, it's going to be a challenge to officiate that consistently and to make sure that that box is the same from official to official, that it's the same from game to game, um, that we are, you know, if that contact is right at the edge of the box, are we calling that as an illegal low block? Um, we're going to see how, how they want to officiate it and how Walt Anderson directs the officials to officiate it. But, 
uh, it is an initiative for player safety, and we'll see we'll see what it looks like going forward. Interesting, interesting. Uh, okay, so the other one, there, there's uh, the onside kick. We'll get to in a moment because that's a bit more complicated to me, anyway. Uh, the idea of a sky judge, um, not exactly the plan here, but the review process is altered a bit here, John. And I wonder your thoughts on it. If you can explain it in detail, what it means for those who are at the stadium, those who are watching on TV. Um, and obviously the idea, the intent here is to, to, to get calls right. So uh, another rule change here is um, reviewing penalties. So it's actually not reviewing penalties, Dave. They are able to, so the replay official who is obviously in, in a booth upstairs, let's think about this as he has his fans know that the replay official could stop the game inside two minutes. They can stop the game to look at touchdowns or, or turnovers, scoring plays. So the replay official has always been able to intervene and, and stop the game to look at a close call. That doesn't change. That aspect of their job, that replay aspect of their job doesn't change. The things that they can look at in, in that aspect were the same as what would be looked at in a coach's challenge. Okay, we're talking about um, possession, completed or incompleted pass, the touching of a loose ball at the boundary, a location of the line to gain, things like that, whether a player is down by contact. Those, those don't so, change. Not, this, not at all. Not, no, no penalties at all involved. Well, well, no. So, but those, for, I, I mean, when for in terms of the replay officials' old duties, and, in terms of stopping the game and looking at those plays, those are those that remains his menu of reviewable plays. But what he can do now, in addition, is in in effect act as an eighth official on the field. So, so oh, a lot of times you might see there's a play at the sideline, okay, and you'll see. The, the the wing official, the line of scrimmage official, he'll come in and rule it an incomplete pass. Well, then the deep wing on that side of the field, he'll come down and he'll tell that line of scrimmage official it wasn't incomplete. He had both feet down. He had possession. It's a catch. So they act in conjunction on the field. The referee might come over and consult with them. They get together and they change it and they say that initial ruling of incomplete, that wasn't the case. The ruling on the field was a catch. Okay, so they act in conjunction, the seven officials on the field. What this change does is add the replay official in that same role as an eighth official being able to use the video at his discretion. So while he, but they put a little bit of a bracket on what he can look at. So he can advise the game officials on specific and objective aspects of the play. So if we talk about something like holding Dave, or we talk about pass interference, those are subjective. Was there a restriction? Those are subjective. Those aren't objective. Objective is, was his feet in bounds? Did he have possession? When he, did he cross the goal line? Did he achieve the line to game? Was the ball past the line to game? Those are objective, not subjective. So those are the kind of things that he can still intervene on when there's clear and obvious vi video evidence, and they're going to be fast and it's going to be seamless. Now, here's here's the challenge for teams. These are plays. Let's say the ruling on the field is an incomplete catch, incomplete pass. Okay, and it's twenty yards downfield. Well, I can see on the first replay, we're upstairs in the booth with the coaches, and we can see that it's a completed catch. This was a bad call. That, that would be a play that we would normally challenge. Now that replay official can fix it. So we're going to wait on that replay official to fix that and save the challenge and save a potential timeout uh, because the replay official can just go ahead and fix that. Now, at a certain point, you know, we have to be aware that the replay official is not going to intervene, and we do need to challenge that um, and especially feel confident about it because w where their standard for clear and obvious video evidence in order to, to intervene with the referee and change something is going to be, we still need to find that out. But that's sort of the parameter of their role now. It's not a full sky judge like they had in the AAF a couple of years ago where that sky judge could intervene on penalties on everything could be, was a true eighth official. This is kind of an eighth official with an asterisk, if that makes sense. Yes. So, so uh, I guess in my, the first thing that jumps to my mind is if a team is in a hurry up offense and you're waiting, like it doesn't necessarily be at the end of the uh, half, do you worry at all that the judge won't? You're waiting around for a second, two seconds, three seconds for the for the judge to to review that play. I, or yes. Do you worry? Yes. About that? Yeah. 
Yes, I do. I think that that would be there is in in a hurry up offense situation. I think the mentality of our teams has to be. You know, if we're on defense, let's say, and the opponent is in a hurry up offense. In terms of a a close call and a potential challenge, um, I would in effect disregard the replay official and we would treat it as if that replay official it, it, it's too important and there's too much of an opportunity to miss it if you start playing games and saying we're going to wait and see if they intervene here when you're dealing with a hurry up offense type situation does that make sense yeah yeah i mean yeah and the, and the goal obviously is to be as seamless as possible i think that's the challenge right like yes we don't want yeah that, that, and, and listen, it's going to be a challenge. It's not going to be perfect this first year. They're going to have some kinks to work out on this. Um, but if, you know, if the Dallas Cowboys throw a pass on the sideline and it's close and I think it's incomplete and it's ruled a catch and they're running to the line, I can't wait for the replay official. I got to, you know, we have to be more proactive than that. Um, if we're on offense and we have a 40 second play clock, that's a, that becomes a different, you know, that becomes a different situation where, maybe there is an opportunity there to save a challenge or protect a challenge. Whenever you throw a challenge flag, you're risking that timeout because you might think, I feel great about this. We had one last year versus New Orleans. It was an Hurts catch on the sidelines. And I'll go to my grave thinking it's a catch. Well, it was ruled incomplete and the ruling on the field stood. So I would have said that was about a 95 percenter that we were going to win that. Well, it cost us a timeout. So you got to be aware. It's a, there's a, there's asset management in terms of these challenges and timeouts. So you want to use this, this new replay official change smartly, but you also don't want to put yourself in a position where you're giving the opponent an edge. It, it makes me wonder if teams coaches have ever lobbied for just one more timeout in a game, please, please, please. This is, sounds like a lot of pressure for you and for, for every decision maker on game day. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the timeouts are precious, and we know that, and especially in close games at the end. Um, the timeouts, the ability to stop the clock there can be um, – are huge. So um, understanding the game timing rules, understanding how this replay official um, – how they're going to manage this. And, and, by the way, the replay officials are like, are like players or officials. They're not all made the same either. You know, they're different, and they have different tendencies, and they're going to look at things differently. So there's 17 replay officials, like there's 17 referees, like there's 32 quarterbacks, and they all have different tendencies. So, you know, being able to – watching this and seeing how this thing trends will be, will be very in interesting. And whether it does end up having a big impact, this may not have as big an impact as some of us think it will. So we'll see. Yeah, yeah. John, another rule change, and I'm not quite sure I understand this one, is where you line up on a kickoff, an onside kick. Sure. Can you let, let's go to this. Let's go to number rule rule change number five here. It's, this is so. It, this is actually quite simple. Um, so think about it this way, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get I'm gonna really simplify it. You can't have more than nine players. So uh, the a, re a receiving team in a in a uh, on an onside kick could basically put every player where the ball is going to be kicked or, you know, where they think the ball is going to be kicked behind the restraining line. So, and I, when I say the ball is going to be kicked, I mean, within that 10 yard zone, outside of that, uh, between the out, out. So there's a 10 yard zone between where the, the ball is spotted and the defense, the receiving team can line up. Well, within that restraint, restraining line, outside that restraining line, you could put everybody. Now you can't put more than nine. So it takes really takes a player out of that restraining line and gives the kicking team a little bit more of an opportunity because there's one fewer potential recovery player inside that setup zone, um, inside that sorry, but behind that restraining line. It takes, put, takes one player out of there and gives that kicking team a little bit more of an edge towards recovering that kick. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see, and we've, already, we've been working on this since it got passed with, uh, with Coach Clay, our new special teams coordinator. He's been great. Um, so, so, and by the way, when we talk about this, we talk about the restraining line is 10 yards from where the ball is, and that's a, 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 from that line to 15 yards behind that. So it's a 15-yard zone. 
So that player that could form, form uh, prior had been in there, he now has to be beyond that 15 yards. Now he can, once the ball's kicked, he can enter that and try to recover, but it, 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 it um, restricts the, the receiving team's ability to recover that ball as quickly. We're going to see how big a difference it makes. And this is the reason, Dave, the, um, the fourth and 15 proposal, which frankly, you know, the, the, the onsite alternative proposal that we've put out the past two years, because of this, that's why we pulled that. We want to see what this does to the onside kick recovery rates. Uh, and then we'll see if what, we, what, what has we'll the rate see. been? What is the rate? What's the round starting? What's the rate been on, on recoveries? Do you, do you have it all? I don't, I don't have, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it was about before they changed the kickoff rules, it was about 16%, 15%. And now it's in the single digits about 6%. So the, the change in the kickoff rules made a big difference in it. And you know, the, what the onside alternative was trying to do was just correct that and get us back to that six to give the, the team that's trailing the opportunity to possess that ball at approximately the same rate that the onside kick did. So, but we want to see what this does and then see, you know, if we can get the onside kick alternative to the point where it would have the requisite uh, support to pass. Um, right. But we don't know. We don't know where those votes. We don't know where those votes were, if it would have passed or would have failed this year. Um, it was certainly in 2020. It got it's got some significant support. So but let's see what this does. Let's see if the taking that one player out can can get can pump those numbers up a little bit for the um, for the, the, the recovery teams, the kicking team, or if, you know, the special teams coordinators are going to be all on top of this and figure out another way to to recover those kicks, and it's actually not going to make a significant difference, but we'll see. Okay. And then I think this is the last one, John, enforcing the rules on extra points and two-point conversions, um, which sounds like it's a pretty simple rule. Can you explain it? It was, yeah, yeah. This is something that happens once a year. Every, Every year with these rule changes, you'll have a rule or two that happen once a year. Um, so uh, really think that it, this, what this does is it ensures the enforcement of accepted fouls committed by either team on, on multiple try attempts. So without boring the listening public to tears, if I, if I kick an onside, if I am kicking an extra point and I miss the extra point and the defense was offside, well, we're going to move up five yards. I'm going to get to retry the kick. Well, now I hold on that. Okay, I hold on that second try. It would it would basically erase under the old rule. It would have erased the first foul. That first foul would have gone away, and we would have enforced a holding foul. Um, we're not going to do that anymore. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna use that the 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 the, the mark the enforcement where the penalties enforced from as the new spot, and then enforce penalties from that spot. Yeah, I think I a lot about penalties. I think I, a lot I, about penalties. I don't know if I've ever seen this happen in my entire in my entire three hundred years. Of it happened to Chicago. It happened to Chicago last year. So, okay. Yeah, I, I I think a lot about penalty enforcement. So um, yeah, that's so yeah, that's that, that that really is what that is, and you won't see it very often. Uh, the the other change is the is is aligning illegal forward pass. It, when you have illegal forward passes, you have two types of illegal forward passes: forward passes thrown from beyond the line of scrimmage, or forward passes or multiple forward passes from behind the line of scrimmage. And they have two separate penalty enforcements in the past. Now we've added a loss of down to any illegal forward pass is a loss of down. They, they changed that in 1997. We're not sure why, um, but what we've done is brought that back where any illegal forward pass, no matter which category of illegal forward pass it is, is going to be, is going to bring a loss of down. Again, you'll see two passes, illegal passes from behind the line of scrimmage, two forward passes from behind the line of scrimmage, You'll see that once a year, or you'll see the quarterback go beyond the line of scrimmage, then run back behind it and throw a forward pass. You'll see these plays once or twice a year um, over all of our games. But but uh, it's important. Some of these things are just important cleanups. So if you have a foul in in one game and then you have a foul six weeks later, that it's handled the same way. And I think that's important. I want John. This is great stuff. I wonder what the next battleground will be in terms of just where the game is going. Any ideas on as we look into the future of 
player safety and, and making sure the game is great always, what, what's next? I think the player safety uh, group at the league office really does do a good job. And I think that the, the player safety rules, I think that um, using taking a data-driven approach to looking at the player safety piece of this is really the vanguard of where this is all going. Um, I think that, you know, sometimes fans don't necessarily appreciate the safety rules or because they do change the game in some ways. Um, but I think once you see our players adapt, um, when the game is safer, the game is better. Um, and so people might initially not understand it or not like it. But I think, you know, you look now, Dave, and you think about, we, we think about um, head contact to head neck area of a defenseless receiver. You don't see it very often. You used to see it all the time. And it used to be a high injury play. Players have adapted and you don't really see it. And it's, uh, you don't really think of it as a negative for the game because you know why? Because that receiver is able to get up and play the next play because it's a safer game for him. So I think that those things are really important. Now, that being said, you know, like making sure that we are taking a data driven approach and that we do have injury data to make changes. Um, because when we make these changes, they're significant. So making sure that they're in the best interest of the game, I think will be really important. The competition committee does a great job of that. And I think getting the competition committee back in person next year after two years of virtual meetings will be, um, you know, these rule, you'll, you might see some more significant rule changes over the next couple of years as they're able to get back in person um, and the, the owners are able to get back in person and have a real league meeting where these rules are really um, – debated and adjudicated in uh, in person, I think will be really good for this process. Interesting. Fascinating. John, I guess with that, we, we get ready for the 2021 season. Anything, hey, man, anything, I've, left, anything I've left down here, anything I, anything no, I need to know about the game. I think the, I think the fans are in for a really exciting season. I think having, you know, you've been, if you've been watching the NHL or the NBA playoffs, seeing those full arenas has been, uh, has been awesome. So I think just having uh, Lincoln Financial Field rocking again um, will be will be such a huge boost, and I think everybody's really excited for that. So uh, it's a long, hot summer, but we're going to get through it, and uh, September's right around the corner here. So, John, thank you. John Ferrari, thank you so much for joining the Eagles Insider Podcast presented by Lincoln Financial Group. Great job. Can't wait to see you back at the NovaCare Complex in just a little while here. Everyone, thanks so much for joining us here on this podcast. I'm Eagles Insider Dave Spadaro. Thanks to Peter Kelly, Ray Doyle for their great work. Thanks to all of you for joining each and every week. And we'll see you next week. In the meantime, have yourselves a great Eagles day. And as always, everyone, fly Eagles fly. E-A-T-L-E-S, Eagles! Welcome to Season 2 of Return Game. Birds, boys and Bad Blood, presented by Novacare Rehabilitation. There's been no brotherly love between these two franchises. It's a rivalry that started when the Eagles were world champions, and it spanned decades with no signs of letting up. The minute the schedule came out, the Dallas Cowboys were circled on the schedule. They were our target. Sure, this might be the city of brotherly love, but there is no love lost when it comes to the Dallas Cowboys. Some fans can't even utter the name of this bitter adversary. America's team. So how did we get here? Philly crowd was tough. This season, we take you from the hit that started it all. The first thing you saw was Timmy getting up off the ground with blood streaming out of his mouth and his helmet off. To the rise of the Cowboys under Tom Landry. Everybody hated us. Everybody wanted to beat us. They really do hate us, don't they? To Dick Vermeil in the illustrious NFC Championship triumph. To Buddy Ball, the Bounty Bowl, and fourth and one. Here we go, fourth down. They give it to Smith and they stop him again! They stop him again! It's Groundhog Day! It's Groundhog Day! They did it again! And the Pickle Juice Game, and the return of T.O., and 44 to 6, and we could go on and on. And we do. You'll hear all of these stories firsthand from the legends who live them. A true all-pro roster of Eagles greats spanning the decades, including Ron Jaworski, Harold Carmichael, Mike Quick, Seth Joyner, Clyde Simmons, Troy Vincent, Bobby Taylor, Brian Westbrook, Jeremiah Trotter, Connor Barwin, Brent Selleck, and many more. It's the beloved heroes. 
the load villains and the iconic moments that make this one of the greatest rivalries in the game today. And for Eagles fans, the one that matters most. It didn't take long to figure out that Philadelphia Eagles fans hated the Dallas Cowboys. When it comes to the birds and boys, you think you know the whole story. But there's more, so much more. And we're about to uncover it all. Return game, birds, boys, and bad blood. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts.